And next up is a regular speaker at our event and a, and a great friend to Pocket Gamer over the years, um, uh, Ted Varney from Wapia, who's going to be talking about maximizing IAP revenue uh, with pricing optimization. All right. Thank you, Dave. Am I can you hear me okay in the back? Okay. Uh, I got my water. Oh, all right. All right, as uh, Dave said, my name is Ted Verani. I am a head of business development for Wapier. And today we're going to talk about maximizing IAP revenue with pricing optimization. And, or another way, think about how to make 20 and 40% more money just by optimizing your prices correctly. And why, why is this a topic important, at least to me, is because uh, you know, pricing is what, you know, like think about pricing, right? You know, if you read the marketing literature, you know, pricing is core to the marketing mix, it even gets its own P among the four P's, if you're reading the literature, but, but it's fundamental. And, and we come to these conferences and we talk about monetization. And then monetization is often, people wanna talk about ad monetization. I'm not trying to take anything away from ads and monetizing there, that's hugely important too, as well too. But the other half of that monetization coin is indeed pricing. You know, and if you are making, a, you know, you're selling your in-app items and you expect people to purchase them, you know, we think that putting some thought and some consideration in terms of what is the right price, the right time, right location is indeed critical for your success. <clears throat> so there is a problem with pricing right now, right? You know, and that's one problem is that most game developers have basically a one size fits all uh, approach when it comes to pricing. Right? So simply put, you're mispriced for the majority of the world um, because people respond differently to different prices. And right now, and that's sort of an obvious intuitive sort of you know, thing we think about ourselves in terms of how we make current purchases. But, you know, again, thinking about gaming, it's a digital good with no marginal cost, right? The right price is what someone, frankly, is willing to pay for. it. And if we can get pricing right, you know, if we can kind of, you know, the beautiful thing about pricing is that it is just a number, right? You know, and a small change to a number has a great outsized impact in terms of whether or not someone will make a purchase you know, indeed for maximizing of your IAP revenue. A little bit on the company. Um, I don't want to spend a huge amount of time here. Of course, I do have three extra minutes. Maybe I just, maybe I just really linger here. Um, but is, um, but no, I don't. I really want to mix commercial less, but we, this is what we do, right? You know, not just pricing, but fundamentally, uh, who is WAP here? We're an AI company with, um, we, we have deep insights into player behavior. We, we take those insights, we try to influence you know, that behavior to a more positive outcome for the game developer. Case of pricing, it's right price, right time, right location. We do that with a lot of big game companies you know, out there um, right now. Um, and you know, so I'm gonna share with you now a little, some information about how you can really do it yourself as well. So it's not really just about you know, come work with us type thing. Two of the main things that we focus on as a company, not the whole entire thing, but part of our, I guess, pricing optimization suite, if you will, is in two things for you to think about, you know, for your own game, you know, is first global pricing, you know, what is the right price on a per country level, you know, for your game. And then secondly, going past that is promotional pricing, right? And here we really are now thinking about per user pricing, you know, for our individual game. First, let's talk about global pricing, right? I don't have any of you guys who are game developers here too, but like if I were to ask you, I have a show of hands, there's a few of us up here, you know, like how many have localized their game? If you are a game developer, like do you think about when you go to a new country, you should put, you know, in another language, right? You know, appropriate for the language. Do you think about the same thing in prices, right? You know, you know I guess that my point of view is that if you've localized your game, made the effort, frankly, to translate it to Spanish, then you should maybe also think about what is for right in the local currency for that you know, country. Because in our, you know, my view is that there's no one size fits all when it comes to pricing. And yet, most game developers, you price your game for United States, that's fair, it's your largest market you know, out there. You price it for United States, but then you just let the app stores do currency rate conversion for other countries. It's not sufficient, right? You know, I mean, and, and going past that, right? You know, even if, you know, is that, you know, because first of all, you know, is you know, the, App stores will adjust your currency conversion when you actually upload and create. Yeah, you're not, not even managing an ongoing basis according to you know, currency rate fluctuations. There's a lot going on in the world right now and currency rates are actually going all over the place. So, but even that alone is not sufficient. But if you are doing that, I applaud you on doing that. You know, most you know, people are not doing it, but then pricing to demand curve and really understanding price elasticities does take some really deep insights into local purchasing power for the individual local economies. 
And then, you know, going past that though, you know, games, you know, you know I'm saying your games, you know, is, you know, you're talking about hundreds of price skews potentially. You're talking about magnifying that on 30 different countries. Potentially you're talking about managing thousands of price skews. So as you do this, you need to think about how you're going to manage, you know, these different you know, skews. But again, you know, just to kind of bang home the point, you know, they mentioned earlier, you know, small change into a number, just your price, you know, has a, makes all the difference to whether someone's converting to a pair, you know, whether they're going to come back and keep making more purchases in you know, yourself. So. And that's a global pricing is localizing your pricing, right? You know, and this is going beyond just, but we want to go beyond just the local currency rate, you know, fluctuation, but instead, you know, so optimize your prices according to someone's willingness to spend across all live SKUs. I want to stress that point. I was having a conversation earlier today with someone who was, and I think they, 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 oh yeah, we did some special promotions in Brazil. I'm like, well, that was all live SKUs? No, no, it was just like a special offer. I'm like, okay, so that's cool that you were doing that, but like you actually potentially was hurting your game economy in that situation because, you know, you've got U.S. prices effectively, you know, in the storefront and then the other special offer was, you know, dramatically lower in terms of, you know, the realities, you know, conversion. So it was, became actually more of a mess. So if you are doing, you need a horizontal price adjustment across all live SKUs is important. And then what we're seeing on average across, you know, now like 100 games is, you know, 20 to 40 percent on average increase on revenue outside the U.S., you know, just by managing prices, sometimes a little bit lower, sometimes, you know, even higher. I get this question, you know, is it a big Mac index? You're using? Like, and it's somehow like, you know, whispering that to me to like, like they're dialed into some sort of like secret, you know, so I don't even know where it began. I mean, maybe someone else knows that. Where did, it be, somehow, where did it begin that where people started thinking that, you know, a big Mac was some sort of universal product around the world that we would somehow price against too. So, you know, but no, you know, fast answer is not doing it because, you know, if you think about it, you know, I don't know, I'm from the US and Big Mac is quite inexpensive. Sometimes you see it like 99 cents advertised. I think it's just an excuse to sell soda, as far as I can tell. Um, you go to some countries, lower and typically lower income countries, where you would think, you know, you got to think about lowering price, a Big Mac might be date night, you know, and actually the local food, which I frankly would prefer, you know, is gonna be less expensive than say going to McDonald's. So, so no, not a Big Mac index, not to belabor that point. Instead, what you want to do and what we do is look at a lot of other data outside of your game, right? You know, so it's not about how people engage in data within your game. I'll get that, you know, a little bit later. But it is um, the, um, you know, all this information is publicly available, right? You know, so it's, you know, really macroeconomic data, you know, so as I mentioned GDP, you know, GDP, publicly available. Your currency, you know, rates out there, the exchange rates and how they're fluctuating against each other, publicly available. This is something you can monitor. This is what we do. This is what you can do in terms of monitoring. Going past that, we do want to understand household purchasing power, right? So that's where understanding microeconomic data. So getting an idea of household purchasing power, we're really doing that. And then going past that, you know, is game statistics, right? So, you know, what is the ratio of smartphones in an individual country? What's your, you know, what's the, um, you know, iOS versus, you know, Android, you know, and then, you know, what, then in game statistics itself, right? You know, what is the transactions going on in the country? Because it's not about necessarily GDP in a country, but it's what's the GDP or purchasing power among the gamer population of that country. And then with that data, you know, we, we've done, what we've done in effect is create a WAPR index as we've been doing this while we know what other games are doing too, but like if you start ingesting this, you know, then start making some sequential price tests directly onto diff, into the app stores, you know, for that, you know, this is what we do people. Key point here is, you know, caution is, you know, we get this question, you know, too, but you don't change price and then next day look at it and see if it's working. It's not enough time. Because when you're measuring impact, try to measure working, you know, you want to look at ARPU on a country level, you know, and let's face it, you know, when you're talking about small number of payers per country, you know, so it's to get enough data to sort of have a measurable impact, you need to let some time pass. So you need to be patient, right? So in our, our case, we'll make monthly price adjustments, you know, on that. And so we do ask our customers for patience, but after like a basic three month calibration, we know we've priced it correctly. We're pricing according to the demand curve going forward. It's small changes to price, right? So we're not suggesting dynamic pricing here, willy-nilly sort of changing very quickly, but very slow, very cautious, very deliberate price adjustments according to local purchasing power. Doing this correctly, you know, what you're gonna see is a big increase in payer conversion. You will, you know, the truth is that some people already were spending in your game, you know, big spenders, they're gonna get a better deal, right? And that's okay. You know, because you know what you're going to have now is more people spend your game, frankly, making your game more healthy, right? You know, as we bring to, and then you're going to see also is, is, is an increase in the number of transactions, you know, for your game too. So again, healthier. So really what we see also is improvement retention just from pricing. So it's not just about 
IAP revenue, but we also see improvement retention. Taking all over all together, you know, you're going to see an increase in IAP revenue just by making a small change to price across all countries. So again, all live SKUs on a per country basis, more or less the same sort of, you know, discount. So discount. Some cases we raise price, just so, you know, so there are some countries that you can think of a high income, you know, the intuitively obvious perhaps, you know, where we've done like UAE, the uh, Qatar, even Switzerland, we've, in those cases, we might have raised price. Actually, funny enough, did Ireland once, <laughs> but, um, but you know, we had the data that backed it up, you know, and but every game is different. So just because, you know, we've had some experience in one game, we always test everything very thoroughly for the next game. So it's even if it's the same genre, it doesn't always. So it begins with a good starting point, but that's not going to be, it's not copying one game and taking it to the next game. A couple, couple of case studies to share. Um, I like this one. Um, it's a casino game. I mean, let's name them, but it's part of a large public company. So they do real money gaming. They um, rely on us for pricing. They, you know, we've been, it's been live since 2018. So the point being, since the pricing is not a set at once done in proposition, right? As I said earlier, we know it's when, you know, the world changes, people come in and out of your game, you know, your pricing also needs to adjust accordingly. But I also like this slide too, it's similar, it shows their experience because, you know, an easy assumption to make, and it's true that you'll see, you know, growth among your lower income countries. So, you know, you expect to see your Peru, your Brazil, your Inc, Romania increases there too, but higher income countries as well. Like, so check out Germany, 81% increase in revenue, right? Similar income as the US, but 81%. So point being, it's just because, you know, someone spends a lot, you know, in the US on your game does not necessarily mean Sweden or Germany in this case will, you know, won't sell for you. Ginger Journey, another game, you know, let's name them. So very large game, hidden objects games out there, you know, on average about 10, 43% increase on a monthly basis, does fluctuate up and down. Harry Potter from Jam City, um, big game, over $2 million of revenue, you know, we're optimizing, you know, for them, about 50 countries. Um, again, similar story. We see this across the board, right? You know, is that, you know, it's a mix of high income, low income, and Eurozone, for instance, great opportunity, right? Think about one currency, one Euro currency, but yet you got your high income Finland to, you know, Greece, you know, and the country. So a lot of variety, but yet one, you know, currency there too. And also, you know, a bigger revenue base often, you know, so getting it just a change price can have a big impact. So gold pricing works. My clicker doesn't. So, um, okay, we fixed our prices, global basis. You know, are you still leaving money on the table? Yes, you are. Um, the, and because really what, you know, we want to think about next is promotional pricing. You know, so this is what we do for folks. First, think about gold pricing is fixing your prices on a per country basis across the board. Promotional pricing, this is when we start really taking advantage of our machine learning technologies, insights to per, um, player behavior, and start doing per user pricing. But we're not talking about dynamic pricing here. We're not talking about like, you know, just rapidly changing price on people. We don't want to become like an Uber, you know, within your game. That's not the idea, suggestion here at all. But price special offers within a game is a great opportunity when you think about it, right? Because special offers, they tend to be event based, they tend to be time-based or seasonal, right? You know, so we are already preconditioned as a customer to see a special offer and expect for it to go away. So from a game developer perspective, that's a great opportunity to sort of, what's the right price? And the right price is what someone's willing to spend for, it, right? So on a very simple level, someone's new to your game, haven't spent at all, obviously it should be less expensive for that person than someone who's already spending your game. But right now, most people treat special offers or promos the same for everyone. Segment your you know, players in there as they come to them and deliver different prices. So we do it from machine learning perspective between technology. I don't want to necessarily describe that, what we're doing, because you know, it's something we help. Instead, what I'd like to offer you is sort of three do-it-yourself hacks that you can do yourself, you know, to think about. It's more about behavioral psychology, you know. One is personalize a special offer. Right? You know, and here, um, one way, you know, and one way to personalize a special offer is to think about um, seasonality. And, you know, so first of all, you know, you know, for any of your special offers in the game, you know, any, and downtime means player engagement, right? So whether it's the morning commute or it's after school or it's a, you know, in the evening time, any downtime is more what more people are playing your game. So that's, you know, more players coming in the game. You really want to think about, you know, you know, doing special offers for them too. The season also, seasonality also translates to time of year. So think about the holidays or the summer months, right? Those are times when people have more time on their hands. Again, 
translates to engagement. But, you know, also consider that whenever, you know, just because you have more people come in the game doesn't mean they're inherently buying. It's actually a little bit the opposite. So, you know, they are actually probably less engaged on your game itself. So it takes something a little extra to get them to encourage them to buy, you know, on that, you know, so that's why you want to think hard about that special offer that you put in. So whether it's a first purchase discount or, you know, some sort of, you know, holiday special thing, you know, thinking about how you're packing up, making that offer for them to be compelling because you great opportunity, more players, you know, coming in during this time, checking you out, but more important to just, you know, when they're at that moment of con purchase consideration to have the right offer in front of them. General, we're seeing, you know, 15 to 30% increase when we're doing promotional pricing for people um, just from, you know, making it targeted. One thing I read, so I brought it up, you know, here is, um, a, you know, one study did saw that for doing your holiday specials correctly, saw 83% increase in revenue above the annual average. You know, so, so time as you're leading into those holiday months, it's your biggest purchase time. Some real thought consideration in terms of how you want to do those. You know, obviously, you want to do Black Friday Day, but don't just do Black Friday Day just like everyone else. Make your special offer timely. So that, you know, point number two. I don't mean, you know, so seasonality is the time of year, so I mean time of day. And what we want to do here is try to pinpoint prime time, right? You know, what do we mean by prime time? So prime time is, um, you know, the time when someone is actually more likely, you know, on average people in the U.S., you know, I'm not sure the global state, you know, you know, the U.S. probably play 24 minutes a day within the mobile game. And that is, um, you know, the peak usage is actually fine. 6 p.m. 10 p.m., which kind of makes sense, but it's, for me it's kind of funny too because prime time was you know, coined, you know, made by advertisers for broadcasting, right? So that's when your best TV shows were always in the evening after work and the biggest ad dollars or the most expensive commercials went on network TV were, that's why I called it prime time. Within your game, that is, might also translate that, so that's an interesting point to know, but get the data for your game. Really understand in, when people really, when because your data might tell you something different, or even better, it's trying to pinpoint that time outside of like the average prime time and the same prime time like that. What's prime time for your game? I once, we did some pricing with a game. It was a, it's a shooter game and actually shooting dinosaurs. Uh, and, you know, and for whatever reason we saw like, there was a lot of people like shoot, you know, activity engagement late at night. And I, I just imagined people like getting drunk at a bar or something and like, oh, the bar's cool. What are you gonna do now? Let's go shoot up some dinosaurs. You know, I don't know what it was, but you know, that's so, you know, it's, you know but knowing your game, when is that period of time that is a good time to price something is a great opportunity for you to think about. So questions to ask, like when are people making purchases? What are the you know, average sessions? What are the average session you know, length within the game? You know, how long are people playing? You know, what's your, you know, when have they made a purchase in the last seven days? You know, are they getting, do you anticipate them making a purchase, right? It all depends on the company and the data you have, and the insights and the data science you might have you know, within your company, but all this data information can really help you to think about how you optimize those special offers um, for, your, for your players. Third one, make special players feel special. You know, make new players feel special rather. So like they, my little boss used to say, bring in the noobs, you know, and, and what we do know is that, you know, 3% of your players are gonna come after day one, they're not gonna come back, right? You know, so one third of people who download you and you spend a lot of money to download, or however they come into your game, they download your game, you're excited, one third is not gonna come back. So let's think hard about like, you know, first purchase if they do see, you know, price, you know, for that, you know, because really our goal here is try to, in the first three days, try to get a purchase out of someone. Those first three days are very critical because, you know, in fact, even 18, you know, I said 30% leave in that first day, 18% of an average game's revenue actually comes in that first day. So people are making some decisions pretty quick on one, one whether they like your game, they're gonna return, you know, two, whether they're gonna purchase. And those early, early decisions are gonna form you know, the lifetime value for that player within your game too. So, so how do we get people to buy? You know, one is to you know, leverage existing data, create a compelling first purchase discount. Everyone should have a first purchase discount, right? Let's just you know, thank people for coming in. You know, let's encourage and make that first purchase. Better is to you know, segment you know, your players. If you can think about, if you have the insights around affluence, so geolocation, if you're able to track that, you know, the device type are strong signals of affluence. Right, someone's coming in from. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, it's a high-income area. That's affluent. You know, other parts of the United States, you know, are less affluent. Right, you know, and um, so that's an important signal. Set an IP promotion to um, run once a user hits their first challenge level. So, what is next, that first challenge level? You know, create a promotion geared around that. We want to get person, you know, more engaged in the game, get them to that next level, reward them for doing that. 
Create bundles of negatively correlated goods. What's a negatively correlated good? This is two items that people might not actually purchase together, right? And so think of a medieval fighting game. If someone buys the broadsword, they're not going to buy the short sword. Okay, so, well, let's package those together, present it as a very steep price discount. Player just thinks, wow, what a great deal. You know, as long as it's more expensive than this one item, you're ahead, you know, on that too. And, they really, and the player actually feels really good about their purchase. So they're actually feeling better about your game, you know, and they made a buy it, buy, you know. As soon as one makes a purchase, they're more likely to purchase again, right? So again, that's our goal here, get that first purchase. Another spoop, it's gotta move along. Uh, message the user directly to alert them to various purchase opportunities. Better to do contextual in-app messages than uh, push notifications. And determine what high, low friction, high value um, item, special offers to be people. What we do know is that, you know, majority of purchases are single use items, but 65% of revenue actually, be, actually comes from lifetime items. So understanding your own game, the mix between those two, think about, use that information to think about what sort of special offer you want to give that, that player. And then a word of caution, to just to kind of close this out, is don't be too generous. You know, and I don't, what does that mean? You don't want to give too much away, right? You know, again, the, first, the goal of the first purchase is to get them to come by again, right? It's enough, you want to give them enough to where they have a taste of it, they have a snack, they're more engaged. They want to, you know, you don't want to give them so much so that they have no reason to buy again, right? So while, Everything I've been saying so far is about trying to get that first purchase in three days. D7 retention is your most critical, you know, statistic, right? So the most important is, you know, you want to make sure you having a 10% D7 retention and you want 10% of those players actually be payers. And if you're not quite hitting that mark, you may be being too generous in terms of what you're giving away earlier on. So watch that very closely and how you give that out. And then you will be, and I've run out of time. These are turn signals on the ensue, but case study here, it works. You know, this is a perfect example, Nanobit Hollywood story, where we took them from global pricing, took them to promotional pricing, um, a net positive impact. You know, and so again, first fix your prices globally across the board. Next, think about how you can you take leverage insights into player behavior to start making your special offers more targeted to boost payer conversion, maximize overall revenue. Run out of time, but I will be in the hallway if anyone has any questions. It's a good thing we started early. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what? That, that was great and perfectly to time, even with the, the extra time. Appreciate that. Thank you. Does anyone have a question? We could take one question. Try and maybe, it was one down here. Are you all right to take a question, Ted? Well, we, let's make I time for that. I don't mind. I don't want to just take away from the next oh, speaker. Okay. So. Well, we'll, we'll build it in at the end. And I met them in the hallway and they seemed very nice, so you should stick around. Yeah, super quick. For um, games with larger communities, do you notice that international, Sorry? for games with larger communities, do you notice that international players will compare notes when it comes to pricing or? Uh, make a, yeah. an unwarranted stink when prices adjust? Well, the fast answer is no, but, um, but you know, worthy of some, you know, elaboration on that is that, um, so, and it's a good question to ask, right? You know, because I think, you know, games are social inherently and something that kind of worried that we do not from global prison, but it's also how we do it. So we are, and I mentioned earlier about doing, you know, sequential steps and waiting some time pass. The only time people notice things like price changes start community, when people, generally people only go to message boards when they see something they don't like. So mostly we're going to lower prices and frankly make the prices more fair on a per country basis. So generally there's not much complaining about that. So people, human nature is we only, we only complain. You know, when we talk about it, we don't like, hey, it's all the price. But, you know, but going past that, the biggest change that we do to a price when we're localizing prices on a per country basis is right away. So let's just agree right away, your game's very mispriced. You know, and, but then after that, one month later, it's a smaller change. And after that, even smaller change. And then going forward, you know, because it's we do optimize monthly, but after that's most recurrence rate fluctuation. So it's five, ten percent. So no, people do not notice it. But you know, and we've tested it. We run, you know, we've we're just, you know, Harry Potter, you know, big game, you know, it's also social, you know, worked with you know some scopely games also that have, you know, where these concerns are very no, so far no, but you know, we we don't we don't want to say it's impossible, you know.